Let's see if we can demonstrate how this frequency domain filtering is performed using the um, frequency response of the filter and the frequency spectrum of the input to give us the frequency spectrum of the output. We know that the frequency spectrum, or the uh, frequency response of the filter h of j omega is equal to v out of j omega divided by v in of j omega, where v out of j omega and v in of j omega are the frequency spectra of the output and the input. Let's be a little more explicit. The, the frequency response has a magnitude and a phase, or magnitude of h of j omega, and an angle theta sub h of j omega, then is equal to the magnitude of the output in its frequency manifestation, which includes a magnitude and a phase. We'll call that theta out of j omega, divided by the spectrum of the input, which consists of a magnitude and a phase that we'll call theta in of j omega. Now we can determine the output, or the magnitude of the output, its magnitude and phase, theta out of j omega, by multiplying both sides of this equation by the spectrum of the input, magnitude and phase, which gives us then magnitude of V in of j omega, angle theta sub i of j omega, times the transfer function written in its polar form is magnitude of h of j omega, angle theta sub h of j omega. Now we can see how by representing this all in their polar coordinates or in polar form, this multiplication simply becomes um, magnitude of the input times the magnitude of the transfer function. You need another line there. Which then gives us mag the magnitude of Vn of j omega times the magnitude of the frequency response h of j omega. Those two give us the magnitude of the input, and then when we're multiplying two complex numbers, we add the phase. So the phase of this product is going to be then theta sub i of j omega plus theta sub h of j omega. So finally, then, we can specify the magnitude of the output, v out of j omega, the magnitude of the frequency spectrum of the output is equal to the magnitude of the frequency spectrum of the input times the magnitude of the frequency response of the filter and theta at the output of j omega is then equal to the phase of the input plus the phase of the transfer function. This may seem a little cryptic at first, but we're going to do an example here in just a second to see if we can't shed a little light on this. But it's important to understand and emphasize that we can determine the magnitude of each of the components in the output by taking the magnitude of the corresponding components in the input and multiplying them by the magnitude of the transfer function at each of those frequencies. And we can get the phase term of the output by adding the phase term of the input for each of those frequencies to the phase of the frequency response function at each of those frequencies. Now the phase is a little bit more challenging to understand or to, to graphically visualize, but let's take a look at the magnitude at any rate. <clears throat> Imagine that we have a frequency or a uh, input signal, V in of T, that consists of one, two, three, four different frequency components. One oscillating at 20 radians per second, another oscillating at 100, another at 300, and another at 600 radians per second. Each of them at the input has an amplitude of 5 volts. This 
the sum of these five terms looks like this. This is v of t graphed as a function of time. You can see a general low frequency component that corresponds to this 20 radians per second, but added to it is a lot of higher frequency oscillation or a lot of higher frequency noise. Now, the frequency spectrum of the input, the frequency manifestation or the way we represent this input signal in the frequency domain consists of discrete frequencies. We've got one frequency at 20 radians per second, another at 100, another at 300, another at 600. And each of them at the input has an amplitude of 5 volts. This then becomes the frequency spectrum or the graphical way of representing the frequency spectrum of the input. Now we're going to determine the magnitude of the frequency spectrum of the output by taking the magnitude of the input frequency spectrum and multiplying it by the magnitude of the frequency response of the filter. To do that, we've overlaid the frequency spectrum of the input on top of the frequency response of the filter. This signal down here at 20 radians per second is going to be multiplied by a value pretty close to 1. So the output, the magnitude of the output of that signal, will be pretty close to the 5 volts as it was at the input. Now, on the other hand, as we look at these higher frequencies, they are going to be multiplied by the magnitude of the transfer function at each of those frequencies, which is an increasingly diminishing value. So the input component oscillating at 100 radians per second will be multiplied by the value of the transfer function at that frequency, which is about 0.7. Thus, the output component at 100 radians per second is going to equal 0.7 times the magnitude of the input, or 5 times 0.7 is approximately 3.5 volts. In other words, that component would be oscillating with an amplitude of about 3.5 volts in the output in the output, whereas in the input it was oscillating at about 5 volts. The component at 300 radians per second is going to be multiplied by a number that's about uh, just less than 0.4. So 0.4 times 5 would give us an amplitude of that, or would give us the amplitude of that component of the output of approximately 2 volts. I'd be writing these in. This would be point, what do you say that was? 0.4 times 5 gives us an amplitude of approximately 2 here. This was a value of about 0.7 times the 5 volt input, giving us an amplitude of that frequency of about um, 3.5 volts at the output. This one we were saying would multiply by a number pretty close to 1, so this was still going to be 5 volts there. Finally, the 600 rating per second component is going to be multiplied by the magnitude of the frequency response at 600 radians per second, which appears to be about 0.2. So we have 0.2 times 5. At the output, this frequency component would have an amplitude of approximately 1 volt. <coughs> so here is our input time domain signal. This would be the, um, the filtered version of that. You'll see now that lower frequency, that 20 cycle per, or a radian per second component, dominates the time domain at the output. You still have these higher frequency fluctuations, but they are at much smaller amplitudes. Their impact in the output has been significantly um, attenuated. Once again, here is that frequency spectrum. We said that this was approximately 5 volts, this was approximately 3.5 volts, this was approximately, what was it, uh, 2 volts, and this was approximately 1 volt. So the time domain function at the output, V out of T then, would equal 5 times the cosine of 20 T plus 3.5 times the, times the uh, cosine of uh, 100 T plus 2 times the cosine of 300 
plus uh, 1 times plus 1 times the cosine of 600 t. The low frequency component still is very close to its original amplitude. These other components have been significantly attenuated. At the input, they each had an amplitude of 5 volts. At the output, they have significantly smaller amplitudes. So what we've attempted to demonstrate here is that a time domain signal all concurrently, or uh, with all of those different frequency components concurrently um, present in the frequency domain can be isolated using this filtering process to give us the filtered time domain signal which has at the output this spectrum and this then would be the function or the time domain function of the filtered output.